So, um, hi everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Kevin Schneider and I'm um, the executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project. Uh, I'll give a little bit more about my background in a second before we start, uh, but welcome to our fourth uh, meeting of our uh, April seminar series. Um, this is our fourth and um, we got one more coming up next week. And uh, this is a special one because it's Earth Day. So happy Earth Day to everybody. It's actually the 50th Earth Day. And so that kind of really frames our whole conversation for today. And indeed, the themes of it really frame um, so much of the work that we do every day. And I especially want to, you know, thank everybody for joining at what is, you know, of course, obviously a, a historically difficult time for all of us. Uh, I know we at the Non-Human Rights Project are, you know, more grateful than ever that we're able to continue doing the work that we do mostly from home. Uh, certainly, we've had to change some things. Uh, this, what we're bringing you today is, is um, part of our effort to, you know, adapt to a changing world and, and reach out to folks, even though, um, you know, we are, we're all pretty much stuck at home. Um, but, you know, it also, I think, presents an opportunity to um, draw parallels to the work that we do. And I think what's happening in the world, the fact that it originated, as we know, um, from our interactions with animals, whether it's consuming them or destroying their habitats, um, it's led to the pandemic that we're facing today. And so while it is awful what we're going through, we're all hopeful that we will get through it and that we might even come out better for it and having learned lessons in particular in how we relate to the planet and all of the other uh, animals that we share it with. So um, before I start taking, I got, we got a lot of great questions from, from uh, a bunch of you. So I'm, I'm excited to start getting into those. Um, but before that, I wanted to give a little bit more about my background. Again, my name is Kevin Schneider. Uh, I'm a lawyer and um, I've been working with the Non-Human Rights Project for about 10 years. Um, I'm calling you from my home, of course, uh, like all of us, I'm at home. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, uh, which has been particularly uh, hard hit by um, by the virus. But we're hopeful that um, you know you see the sun behind me and there's um, birds chirping. So it is springtime, and you know I think there's a hopeful there's hopeful signs that we've kind of turned a corner. Um, but uh, like I said, I've been with the organization for about ten years. I started as a volunteer before law school, and uh, reading about Steve's work was really uh, a turning point for me. Steve Wise, of course, our founder and president and uh, really a kind of hero, I think, to so much, so many of us, myself included. Um, reading his work as a college student, you know, thinking, what am I going to do with, uh, with my life? Realizing that there were these terrible problems in the world um, uh, that I thought were, you know, not getting enough attention, having to do with animals, right, and the planet and the environment. And so much of it seems to do with um, I noticed after especially reading Steve's work with the law. The law doesn't necessarily create these problems, but it allows them to continue. It gives them some kind of structure. It gives those who want to exploit animals in the environment um, really the ability to do so, and to do so in a, uh, an efficient way, which often is, uh, is, is terrible for animals and for the environment. And now we're seeing can have uh, very negative consequences for us too. So. Um, all of that about well over 10 years ago now drove me to get involved with the NHRP. Um, I started as a volunteer and uh, continued through law school as a volunteer. And then after uh, I started you know, working and living in New York uh, for a couple of years, uh, the position of director became available. And because you know, I knew Steve quite well, um, he trusted me to take on the job. And that was about five years ago. So I'm happy to very happy to uh, be able to continue doing this work. And um, before I got started, he's, he's making a little noise behind me. My coworker here, uh, Trip, wanted to uh, to say hello before before I got started. He's um, he's just a little slightly upset that I'm talking right now on the phone and not taking him outside. But uh, but he can wait. He can wait for for us to get through these questions. I'm quite sure. So. Um, yeah, with that, um, I'll uh, ask Mickey to uh, queue up. Uh, we actually are, this is exciting for us. We're, we're, we're kind of mixing it up here and, and, and we asked for folks to send in their questions by video. So I'm um, excited to start uh, getting into those. We got some 
pretty challenging one. So um, <laughs> I hope I'm ready. All right, let's get it started. I love the little trip feature as well. <laughs> well, I had to, I had to. Well, you didn't tell everyone where, where you um, met him. Oh, well, that's a great story too. We had a staff retreat last summer uh, where, you know, we're all, we all work from home. We're spread across the country. Um, but periodically we get together uh, a couple of times a year at least um, to just share ideas and, and be together in person. And uh, we were in upstate New York in this beautiful country home of a, of a really good supporter of ours who runs uh, a group called the Animal Farm Foundation. And a big part of what they do is take in pit bull type dogs, big dogs who are kind of socially maligned for one reason or another, but are really great dogs. And um, we were up there and I met Trip, Trip up there. Um, he's called Trip because he has three legs. He lost a leg when he was, he was just a puppy, but um, he's a really sweet, sweet guy. And uh, I met him up there and then he ended up coming home with me. So uh, that was almost a year ago now. So um, I'm really glad that, uh, you know, with everything going on now, I have uh, some company. So he's been a real lifesaver in more ways than one. <laughs> I love it. I'm sure, as many of you know out there, um, we, we get some great photos and, and stuff from, from supporters who uh, share their, their, their pet stories. So we appreciate all that. Definitely. All right, let's get these questions going. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Hi, my name is Jay Johnston. I'm 13 years old and my favorite animal is a panther. And my question is, how do you identify the animals that become your clients? So this is a really great question. Thank you for that. Uh, we often get this from law students and lawyers. So it's a very um, obviously uh, important question. So we work uh, a little bit differently than a lot of other groups out there. And there's lots of different groups. I'm sure some of you know that do uh, great work for animals. And oftentimes they're responding. They might get a call. Somebody says there's someone down the street who has say tigers in their backyard or something and is, is mistreating them. And they will do, they'll come in, they're lawyers for those groups and come in and do whatever they can under the circumstances to try to use existing laws, federal laws or state laws or both, um, or to take other, you know, steps, campaigns, petitions. And sometimes that does work. But the problem that we face, because we're trying to accomplish a very specific goal in the law, we're trying to accomplish really for the first time the recognition that an animal other than a human can have any rights at all, uh, we have to view our cases from a different perspective. So we first decide on the state. If you go back, you know, 10 years or more, uh, we researched every one of the U.S. states plus other jurisdictions and uh, to see which ones might be the most promising for bringing the types of lawsuits that we do, habeas corpus petitions uh, for captive animals, chimpanzees and now elephants and soon others. And so we first have to decide on the state where we think this can work. And that kind of limits our options, at least for right now, to begin with. And then uh, we look at a relatively small set of species right now, and we can talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, so we're looking right now at the four species of great apes, chimpanzees, elephants, uh, I'm sorry, chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, bonobos and orangutans, um, and then also dolphins and whales, and then elephants. So that's Asian and African elephants. And we do this because uh, for well, a number of reasons, but the main one is the most important for us is these are species that science tells us are what we call autonomous. Uh, I shouldn't say what we call autonomous. It's what scientists um, and now, you know, judges and others are, uh, are referring to as autonomous. And what this means is that um, a, a being, whether it's a human or an elephant or chimpanzee, who is autonomous um, can really make their own decisions. They are not just, they're clearly not running on instinct. They are thinking about their past, their present, their, their future, planning for their future. You know, they have a personality in the case of chimpanzees, they can recognize themselves in a mirror. 
um, all these striking things that don't make them morally more important or worthwhile than say a dog or a fish or any other animal, but legally speaking, we think makes a world of difference, at least right now, because the situation that we're facing uh, in this country and most of the world is that no animals at all can have any rights. And so we go on the theory that we're most likely to begin winning these victories if we start in a narrow way, if we're not talking necessarily about every single animal, but we're bringing a case for one animal of one species and uh, we're talking about them and this and the, them being autonomous. And autonomy too, is it's not something that we think is necessarily morally more significant than any other characteristic that we might share with, with, a, with animals or that we might not even share with animals. The thing about autonomy that means a lot to us lawyers is uh, judges really do care about it. There's cases for hundreds and hundreds of years that talk about autonomy or liberty. And we think these are values that are very powerful, um, not least because the judges in our jurisdictions in our countries in the US and our states um, claim to really care about them. And so when we talk about autonomous animals, we are not making up a value. We're coming to the courts with a value that they already claim to believe in, but obviously with, with a twist, right? We're saying that, well, science now tells us you know, when these laws were passed to protect animals 50 years ago, welfare laws and different things, they might have had some good intentions, but they never really questioned whether we can own these animals or keep them in captivity. But in those years since, you know, science has told us so much, certainly about these species and so many others, that uh, we think it demands the attention of the courts. And indeed, uh, the courts have begun in New York and other states to uh, finally respond and basically tell us that we're right. That, or that we're all right, that when we say that, you know, science tells us that they have interests that, um, that go very deep, you know, we can't deny them. Uh, the law really has to respond to that. If it, again, because it claims to care about liberty and autonomy and all these things, um, if, it, if it continues to turn us away to deny animals, all animals, any kind of rights, uh, we argue, we think that the system is kind of undoing itself. The judges are undermining their own system. And I think, you know, they're really starting to uh, recognize that in a, in a, a very powerful way. Um, but this doesn't mean, again, that we are limited forever to these species. It doesn't mean other folks can't find um, ways to create rights for other species. For example, working through legislation. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but we think in the coming years, certainly if, if we have anything to, to say about it, we'll start to see state and federal laws that actually recognize rights of animals. But until we get there, um, we think there's a lot that can be done through the court system. And, um, but the somewhat of the downside perhaps of the court system is that we think right now we are limited, again, in the, in the species that are eligible right now. But you know, science keeps revealing more to us um, and, and so we, we are always open-minded to expanding our list, but we also think uh, it's important to keep things narrow because the judges themselves are worried about, you know, and the judges that we go in front of, a lot of them are very sympathetic, especially when we're talking about elephants, for example, Happy in the Bronx Zoo, the judge in that case was extremely sympathetic, but I am quite sure that in their minds, they're also thinking, well, and you know they have lawyers from the other side that come and say these things to the if they say things like well if you give rights to elephants then we're all going to be forced to be vegan or um you know you won't have farmed animals anymore you won't have all these other things and we know that that's not true right we're talking about just these species there's nothing that would say that that has to necessarily apply to other species um but if we talk, you know, if we talk really about all these different species, we, we could create problems for ourselves. Uh, and so that's, that's why we, um, we start with the ones that we have. Great. Right off the bat with a tough one, huh? I know. I hope they get easier after this. That's... <laughs> all right. Let's watch the next one. Hi, my 
My name is Violet, and this is my favorite animal, a whale. And my question is, what is it like to be another animal? Because I'm a vegetarian, and to me, I feel like it's going to be, imagine you got shot, and you were getting eaten, even though you're dead. Imagine that happened to you, because animals have feelings, we're animals, so yeah. Wow. I like that question a lot. Um, thank you. It's also a very hard question. Wow. That might be, that's even harder than the first one, I think. Um, because, you know, it, <laughs> and not to get too, uh, too kind of deep into it, but this raises these very um, profound questions about consciousness, you know. Um, I think, you know, you can read about scientists um, who are working to try to understand our own consciousness. You know, how do we, how do we ever really know what's going on in another human being's mind, let alone the mind of another species? So I think that we're so early on in trying to figure that stuff out that it's, it's actually quite exciting um, that there's still this very mysterious thing in the world, um, you know, our own consciousness and especially the consciousness of others. But we are getting better at it. And I think that science will continue to get better and the way we understand it and process it. But I think to, you know, look at your favorite animal, the whale, um, the way that they move about through their world, right? Um, is so much different than, than what we do that it kind of is like, it's just hard to imagine. But if we can even think about for example, moving about through the water or being the size of a city bus or uh, moving with a pod of others. Um, this isn't whales. I think some whales do this, but certainly dolphins. Um, when they're born, it turns out that they, they make a sound. They actually name themselves. So they come up with a sound, which is really their name. And then other dolphins will use that to communicate with them. So just that alone to me is, is remarkable. And, and one thing I, I did read, this story has always stuck with me. Um, I, think in, I think in South Africa, there's a place where elephants will come to this cliff from time to time and just kind of stand there and look out at the ocean. And it's been seen, they'll do it when whales are coming by. And they, there, there is some measurable amount of, you know, very low level frequency, uh, you know, sound going between them that we can't really hear, but you can pick up with different instruments. And, you know, I think it's so early and hard to say what exactly they're doing. And I think we also have to be a little careful to not read too much into things, but we also can't ignore stuff that's happening right in our face. I mean, it looks to me like that's a whale and an elephant having some kind of conversation and you hear these stories even, you know, happening now with, with humans being stuck to their homes all over the world. You're hearing more and more stories of animals coming out and seem to be expressing genuine curiosity. I, I know dolphins I've heard about in parts of Italy will, you know, are, are swimming further in than they ever would. And they're looking up at the humans and saying like, you know, like, what are you doing? Why aren't you guys out in your boats and, and doing all this stuff that you usually do? Um, so I think that, they are, one thing I'm very, I can feel pretty comfortable saying is that animals watch us so much more than we watch them. And I think they're so much more aware of, of our presence, but also our absence. And I think sometimes they're even really genuinely curious and want to observe us. And I think that's an exciting thing, but something we also have to really respect and not, so our response to that shouldn't be, oh, you're cute. Let me put you in a tank. It should be, wow, you're, you're an amazing creature. How do I protect you so that we can keep having this kind of interaction for future many generations? So I'm gonna stop there before I really get myself in trouble trying to answer this very profound question from this young lady. <laughs> very profound. All right, let's go to the next. Do you have any plans to start helping whales like you did with the elephants? 
Jamie Walder. Thank you. I think Jamie, I think was your name. Yes. So um, I was just talking about whales. I, I mean, I love all kinds of animals, all animals. Some I'm afraid of. I'm, I still love them too, but whales are special to me. So um, yes, we do. Uh, some very exciting news actually is happening as we speak. Just in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten some exciting updates. Um, so first, with respect to orcas, um, killer whales, who are actually dolphins, but I'm going to lump them together into cetaceans. I hope that's okay. Um, so we are, we have been talking for years about filing um, a habeas corpus case, very similar to the cases we filed for elephants and chimpanzees, uh, for orcas, um, probably at SeaWorld. So I'm sure some of you are, have seen um, blackfish and other things about SeaWorld. And, you know, when I talk about putting them in tanks, that's mostly who I'm thinking about, right? And so for a very long time, we've wanted to bring a lawsuit against them and really challenge this. We think there's a lot of sympathy for orcas because they're, they're so intelligent. We know so much about them and we know how wrong it is to keep them in captivity the way that we do. So the reason we haven't, the main reason we haven't been able to do this so far is that there is not yet a sanctuary that can take um, an orca because they have been either taken from captivity for so long, I'm sorry, taken from the wild for so long and put in captivity, or many of them were raised, born in captivity. You can't just, you know, release them into the wild. They have very complex social systems that they rely on to survive, um, unless, you know, they're transients. But even they, you know, have cultures that they have to fit into. It would be like, you know, if you didn't have parents or any human interaction, and then you were just kind of thrown out into the streets of New York and, you know, say someone said, good luck, you know, you would be hopeless. It would be probably very cruel. So we think there has to be a sanctuary for these, uh, you know, these ones who've had their freedom stolen from them. Um, unless, you know, if there's any possibility that it could be done, I think that's always worth uh, looking into. But I think we have to be very careful about you know, any kind of reintroduction into the wild because of really all the challenges. Um, but in Canada, there's now at least one, um, they just announced uh, soon to be sanctuary that will accept orcas and also potentially belugas and maybe dolphins and others. So um, we're very hopeful that in the coming years we will, and we've now started the process of the very important process of gathering all the scientific evidence about orcas. You know, all of our cases really do rely on the best science, the most modern cutting edge science we can find about the cognition of these animals, what goes on in their minds, how they work in the world, um, how they, their cultures, the way they communicate. And then we take all that and present it to the courts and say, look, you have to, you know, really take this seriously. And so that process has already started. We're, I'm very excited to, to have those suits begun to be filed. Like I said, hopefully in the next year or two, we'll see those. And then, you know, looking out into the um, broader world, you know, the natural world, I think, um, you know, we're talking a lot about our lawsuits, which involve places like SeaWorld or the Bronx Zoo, you know, these captive situations. Um, which I think it makes a lot of sense for us to start there because of habeas corpus and all these different legal reasons that we don't need to get into right now. But um, when we're talking about protecting them in the wild, it's a different set of concerns. But I'm, I'm very hopeful that in the next couple of years, we will see, we've already started to see some interest from, um, you know, a number of different lawmakers and different um, people in positions of authority who want to explore the idea of having, you know, rights in the real world, um, in the natural world itself. And so, you know, I'm very hopeful that we can see um, in the not too distant future, whales in particular and others um, in the ocean have rights themselves. And I think that would probably have to happen through a statute more so than a uh, you know, case by case kind of thing, like what we're doing now. But I think a lot of the same ideas will apply. And so that's one thing that we are beginning to work on now is how do we take the ideas that we are developing in the courtroom in these kind of narrow circumstances 
um, and how do we then um, apply that out into the real world where um, where we really you know need to see these changes take effect so um, so yeah we definitely do have plans for whales and I'm personally very excited um, to see those and I will mention for anyone who wants to uh, learn more we have a um, good friend of ours uh, named uh, Brandon Keim, K-E-I-M, and he, if you look him up, if you're interested in whales, he's done a number of, he's written about us, but he also writes about whales and some of the fascinating things that we're learning about them, the way that they, kind of my favorite example is that in the wild, you know, they will meet each other in these very large groups, or they, you know, move around in very large groups, certain species of whale, and they will actually deliberate in what scientists refer to as vote. You know, they will, if they're trying to decide, should we go this way to look for food or should we go this way? And they will actually deliberate it. And uh, what, like I said, hold appears to be a vote. Um, so it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff that we think can really help change the minds of skeptical judges. Great. Okay, let's. So on to the next. Hi, my name is Alila. My favorite animal is a sloth. And my question is, what does NHRP do for elephants? Okay, lots of great sloths are really cool. Um, so yeah, elephants, of course. Um, our first case was filed in Connecticut on behalf of elephants. We're now fighting Happy's case. And we're also seeing through our international work how um, if we can continue to make progress, which we will in the U.S. courts, um, we are very confident that that will be able to be used by lawyers in other countries, especially where elephants still live and thrive. Well, I shouldn't say thrive. They're, they're very much uh, under threat. Um, but they have the potential to thrive in, in parts of Africa as well as throughout Asia, in particular India. And that's a country that we're working with. Uh, now to hope to begin filing lawsuits and doing other work there. So um, yeah, we're, we, we hope that we're doing a lot for elephants because we think uh, not only are they magnificent and important to protect, but that there is a tremendous amount of sympathy around them because they're so, because they're so large and they're so obviously uh, like us in, in these ways that are, we think are really important. Uh, things like grieving or communicating or having a community, um, we think those are, you know, really powerful values that that should help our case. What's the next one? Hi, my name is Kayla. My favorite animal is an elephant, and I want to know how you guys can protect all of their forest home and environment. Thank you. Well, that's another great question and, and kind of goes back into uh, some of the previous ones. Um, I think, you know, the, the best idea that we have, uh, or at least, you know, one of them is that by convincing courts and legislators and lawmakers here in the U.S., which is not home, obviously native home to any elephants, but is still an important uh, hub you know, we import or have imported a lot of them. We have a large number of them captive. And we also have, you know, resources and, and authority to, um, to demand certain changes. So um, we are trying to put all of that together in the hopes that um, it can be combined with, as you said, um, protecting where they live. Because the beauty of, say, giving rights to elephants to have a patch of forest. Let's say, for example, they have a right to, you know, to live there freely, that they basically own it in some way, right? That, when you think about it, actually protects the other animals there as well. If, if you have to protect it for the biggest animal, the elephant, uh, the most kind of noticeable animal, then you're also, by virtue of that, protecting it for so many of the smaller ones that really are the uh, heart of, of the forest, which, as we know, um, you know, on Earth Day, it's so important to reflect on the fact that that's what keeps us alive. You know, the, the natural world that we, I think, have taken for granted for a long time, we're, we're now starting to finally realize that without it, we, we're, we're, we're done. And so we have to adjust our behavior 
And a big part of that, I think, is respecting the rights of elephants and then respecting um, where they live, really the rights of the forests themselves as well. Great question. Very good question. All right, let's go to the next. I'm ready. My name is Mud, and my favorite animal are lions. And I have a question. If you um, save lemurs also by any chance? Well, that's a great question. I can tell from your bookshelf that you're a very studious and well-read young man, so I respect that, a scholar. Um, so lemurs are, you know, like so many other um, uh, creatures like we've been talking about, they're not on our list directly, but my hope is that in the broader picture, when we start seeing more countries and parts of the world take up this idea, uh, we can protect whole ecosystems and really begin to, you know, see all of the species within them protected um, while we continue to focus on the rights of, you know, these right now this relatively few number of species but we think um you know that that still has a lot of value to protect um really the rest of the planet as well mm -hmm. okay. my name is myrus i love all animals but one of my favorite is the elephant my question is, when is Happy the Unhappy Elephant going to be freed from the Bronx Zoo? Uh, that is the billion dollar question that we're all desperate to answer. So um, right now, of course, with um, the pandemic, the virus shutting down most of society, we think that um, it could be difficult to to do any kind of move but of course we're going to continue to monitor that and and um we're always ready to make it happen uh as soon as the bronx zoo finally says we give up happy can um you know we're ready the sanctuary our partners are ready to to accept happy and um so with any hope it will happen um within you know a number of months but Based we've seen from the Bronx Zoo so far, um, I don't expect that they will willingly give up happy um, yet. Uh, we have another court date um, for happy. We're working on her appeal right now. So we were in the trial court uh, at the beginning of the year and we got an opinion that it was very positive. Uh, it didn't give us everything that we wanted. It didn't set happy free but we think it gets us very close in a lot of important ways. And um, like I said, we're appealing that right now and that will be later this year that that gets heard. Um, there's a chance that we could win there and then the court orders that happy um, be released. It seems more likely that the case will continue, but uh, you know, for a number of years, I, I'm afraid to say, but um, I should. I will also say that when we take on a client like Happy or any others, we also pursue other avenues to get them out. We repeatedly tell folks like the Bronx Zoo or anyone else who owns one of our clients, keeps them captive. We say we will drop this lawsuit if you agree to send them to a sanctuary. So we've continuously made that offer. Again, we don't expect the Bronx Zoo will do it. Um, I don't want to speak too much for them, but it seems like you know, throughout the zoo industry, um, there's a real fear that if they essentially admit that any species is not appropriate for captivity, that it will be hard for them to continue to justify for other species as well. Um, that's really not an issue that we take on, really. We, we are there to talk about happy, we're talking about elephants, but um, you know, for the zoo, I think they have a lot of other factors in mind when they, when they look at this. and. Um, you know, also they think they see happy as a way to continue bringing, paying visitors to the zoo. So it, um, it, it's, it's a struggle, but we're not anywhere near giving up and uh, we won't give up until, uh, until she's out of there. Yeah. All right.
Hi, my name is Charlie. Hi, I want my favorite animal is chimpanzee. I want and I want to know how they can swim through the trees. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. That's a fun question. All these, we've had some very serious ones, so I'm glad. So chimpanzees are amazingly strong. In addition to all these other amazing qualities, they are many times stronger than a full-grown man, uh, which can make them dangerous, right? I think that's why, um, and I'm glad you appreciate and, and, and love chimpanzees like, like I do, um, but they also need to be respected, you know? If, if, if their space is invaded, they can react very violently and strongly. So that's how they're able to swing through trees. They have this tremendous body strength that allows them to do that. They've adapted over millions of years because of course we as humans share 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Um, it really was only, um, you know, in geological time in the age of the planet, it was very recently that we split off, you know, it, it was, it was us and then chimpanzees and then chimpanzees and bonobos that are also very similar to each other. And um, so we, we obviously went off in a different, different evolutionary path, began walking upright and doing different things. Uh, but chimpanzees continue to live in the trees. And so it's a, it's a vivid example of how much, uh, you know, evolution and uh, the, the circumstances of, of different species can, can change them. And, uh, yeah, I, I sometimes wonder what it would be like and how fun it would be to be able to, to swing through trees like that, but um, I'm not a chimpanzee, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have time for some more. I'm glad we got so many good ones. Intelligence as like, apes, elephants, and whales. So, that was so I th the question was about what other animals have the um, level of intelligence as great apes, elephants, and whales. So I, I think that um, for me personally, it's important to um, step back from that question and think about what we mean when we say intelligent, because I think that all kind, you know, animals have their own individual ways, different species of showing their intelligence, right? If we think about intelligence as ability to continue surviving, uh, which makes sense as a way of thinking of intelligence, then I think it really broadens out how we think of that. Because um, one thing that's very important for me to stress always is that we're not, um, we're not saying that, you know, these certain animals deserve rights because they're, they're intelligent like we are, that there's somehow a dividing line that if you're, that you're smart, you're smart, you get rights. I think that's a um, not, it, it it's understandable, but I think that it's important to to keep a more open idea of what we what we mean when we say intelligent. But if we're talking about autonomous, right, that's a different thing because that's a sort of a more narrow category. And uh, actually, there are um, there's more and more science coming out about different species of birds, in particular African gray parrots. Um, many of you may be familiar with Alex, who passed away a number of years ago, but was famous for learning not only a lot of words and being able to vocalize them, right, as a parrot, but he could uh, do, you know, deduce logical things. You know, you could ask him questions, mathematical questions, or you could ask him, you know, what color was the block in his mouth and he could give you an answer, you know. Um, that sort of stuff, uh, again, you know, we think of that as intelligence, but I think that one of it's part of our, you know, understandable bias as humans. We, when we see behavior that looks like our own behavior, we say, oh, that's intelligent, right? But to me, I look at a bird and I say, wow, what kind of, that's amazing, right? You can fly. So I think that it's all very relative, right? And I think certainly part of what we try to do is, is, uh, is instill the value that, um, you know, that there are sources of value um, well beyond just kind of our own human lens on things. And I think that's really an important part of so much that we do. Yeah, great. What is your name? Greg Sinna.
Dwaj Sena. All right. Dwaj Sena, what is your favorite animal? Lump and hoop. Lump and hoop. Who are they? They are cows. They are cows. Oh. And, and, and hoop is a calf. Uh, hope is a calf and lump is a cow. They are your favorite animals? And why do bad people eat animals? Why do bad people eat animals? I don't know. We have to ask that question. So, would you like to know the answer? Yes. Then say please. Please. Okay. Wow, they... They didn't give me any, save any easy ones for me. So I think the question is, why do we eat animals? And it's a big question. Um, for me personally, I, that was a big part of my own journey to doing the work that I do now is uh, stopping eating animals. Uh, and I was raised like so many others, um, eating them and right, not really thinking about it, even though I loved our dog and I loved our you know, birds and our hamster and so many others. Um, it took me until a little bit later in life, uh, you know, in college time or high school to start to figure out that I wasn't comfortable with eating animals and to really start to learn more about it, which can be scary and can, um, I think, make you uh, very unsure about a lot of different things in the world and the way other people see the world and how that can be so much different than the way that you do. So, I mean, I think it's a, I don't have a great answer for it other than um, that there's historical reasons, right? I think there, there was a time in our history where that's how we survived, right? The way that some people say, oh, well, that's what animals do in nature, right? Lions will eat the gazelle and you know, this one will eat that one. It's, it's the way of nature. But uh, the problem with that argument is that we don't live in nature, right? And we're constantly, most of us anyway, and we, and we make a point of not living in nature. And that comes with a different set of norms and, and you know, what we call civilization. So it's a very different argument to say, you know, what animals do to survive in nature. Um, basically, we shouldn't use that as a, a moralizing, you know, source of morality, right? To make ourselves feel better about it. You know, like some people say lions, yeah, they eat, you know, gazelles, but they don't raise them in factory farms, right? Before they do it. And I think you know, it's obviously somewhat of a joke, but it's raises an important difference, right? There's, there is an important distinction there that I think gets glossed over. But, you know, I think largely it's, it's, it's not about surviving for 99.9% .9 of people. I I think in the world that, that do eat animals. I think it's largely, it's cultural. And, um, you know, certainly in our country, the U S we eat a lot of meat. Um, there are plenty of countries that eat lots of meat and it's, uh, it's seen as kind of a right, like a ba almost a basic right. And so there are, there's, it's a very complex problem. I think something I've certainly spent a lot of time thinking about, but we also, um, you know, ourselves as an organization, the Non-Human Rights Project, we make a point to not to take not take the issue on head on, not because we don't care about it or see it as vitally important, but because um, we've chosen to take a rather different focus to begin with. And like I mentioned earlier, part of the problem that we face is that we're trying to accomplish something that has never been done. That is animals other than humans having rights. And so we think that we have to make it as easy a lift as possible for the judges or legislators or whoever we're asking to do this, just because it's so historic and we know they're going to face so much, you know, blowback for it from all kinds of sources that, that will be opposed to this new idea. Anytime, you know, we look back over history, especially the last couple hundred years, you know, movements to end slavery to um, for women to, to win the vote to regulate or end child labor, um, you know, these things, they followed a similar path and I think they really do continue to. And there's always going to be a lot of opposition, a lot of fear mongering, uh, you know, if, for example, when gay marriage was being debated, um, 
you would see people say things like, well, if we allow this, then someone will marry their dog. Or, you know, they would come with what we often refer to as a slippery slope argument uh, as lawyers. Um, that's a situation where, you know, somebody seems to be arguing, uh, you know, they don't really have a good argument, but other than to say that if you allow this, then the world is just going to uh, basically go to hell. And so we need to guard against that. You know, we've seen in our own cases where, um, even though we don't talk about agriculture or any hunting and these other issues, they are injecting themselves into our cases and they're telling the judges, they're warning the judges that we're trying to, you know, sneak something past them or something that we have a hidden agenda. We really don't. Um, and we think that's important. We, we have a limited uh, scope that we're working on right now. Um, and we think that that can create a lot of value, but we also, recognize that we can't take on every problem. But that being said, I've seen it myself personally that, um, for example, folks who have seen the documentary about us unlocking the cage, came out on HBO a few years ago, it's still on HBO Go if you have access to that, or it's on iTunes, it's a good uh, thing to watch maybe during uh, this lockdown. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard from people who have seen that, and even though it doesn't, again, take on uh, the idea of eating animals in any way really directly at all i've i've heard a number of people come out and say wow that you know forces me to question you know continuing to eat animals and some people have said I, I you know i can't do it anymore because of of some of the ideas in the film so i think you know it works a little bit indirectly but there is these things are in a bigger picture very much related definitely that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> Hi, my name is Reeve. I am 10 years old, and my favorite animal is a chimpanzee. My question is, what legal rights do you think chimpanzees should not have? So, uh, Reeve is a, a buddy of ours. Uh, it's good to see Reeve again. Uh, we worked with with him on a school project that he recently did. Um, he, he lives in Bermuda and we, um, we just did a, a project together with him about chimpanzees, which was a lot of fun. So this is a, a really good question. Um, the question is what, chimpan what rights should chimpanzees not have? So um, I think, again, it's important to this, you know, step back a bit from this one and think, well, what rights are there possible? You know, what rights can, um, what we say an entity have. When we say entity, we might mean a human, but we might also mean a corporation, or we might mean a river, or a church, or a ship. All of these things have been persons under the law for a very long time, and they've had rights. Uh, so things like rights to own property, rights to sue, rights to be, they can be sued, you know, rights to, um, to all kinds of different little, you know, legal, sometimes technicalities. But in theory, um, and this is kind of a almost absurd sounding thing, but there's an infinite number of rights that we could conjure up, that we could think of. And courts all the time, you know, usually it's humans or they might be a one corporation and a human or two corporations and they're fighting in court. And that often changes rights, it creates rights. Sometimes you have rights that are sort of almost unique to one, you know, type of party and might not come up that often, but you know, they're important for a certain case. Um, so I often think not so much about what rights, I don't think about what rights they shouldn't have because it's really quite simple, I think. Um, we, we've thought about this a lot and you know, we're thinking about a chimpanzee or an elephant or a whale. You know, what rights that we have are really relevant to them? And we've come down to really two and that's bodily liberty, which is the right not to be held in captivity or confined which is one of our most basic rights, of course, and uh, the right to bodily integrity. And that's kind of a fancy way of saying that you can't be cut open or assaulted or basically, you know, injured in any way, which is another one of our kind of most basic rights and something that we're protected by, by criminal law and all these different things. And so um, those we think are really the two basic rights that are very much relevant to chimpanzees and other species but we're also you know open-minded to 
other ideas. I, I've done quite a bit of reading. There's, I, there's been folks who have done quite a bit of scholarship on this. I, I've read it, I should say, um, about this idea that um, you know animals might have something like a property interest. Uh, they might be able to, like I mentioned before, have a, a right, some kind of ownership right over a forest or even a, a wildlife corridor, so that you know that they can um, just live their lives, so they can find water, so they can find food, so they can migrate um, the way that you know that they have for millennia and so I think we should always be thinking about what rights might be relevant but um, when you think about bodily liberty and integrity the freedom and you know not being harmed those uh, I think are really gets you really most of the way um, and you know the animals can under those circumstances can kind of take care of it and that's that's the beauty of, of it. These questions are so insightful. I know. We have some really great young supporters. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the next one. Hi, my name is Celine, and my favorite animals are bunnies. Okay, so here's my question. If you were offered a job that has nothing to do with animals, do you think something's really good? Would you do the job? Okay, uh, so that was an even bigger and more impressive bookcase. So kudos to that. But also, uh, so the question, if, if um, anyone didn't hear it, I think there's some noise behind me, was if I was offered a job that was a cool job that had nothing to do with animals, would I take it? And that's an easy one. Finally, I got an easy one. Uh, no, this, you know, this is my uh, dream job. Like I said, I, uh, it was well over 10 years ago that I started thinking about it and it was about 10 years ago that I got involved with uh, NHRP. So for me, um, being able to, um, I think one of the many exciting things about this is, you know, it combines so many things I care about and I find interesting, you know, science and the law, but you know, it was also extremely meaningful. It's also timely, I think, even more and more by the day. Um, it's 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 an interesting experience to you know get involved with something like this that's quite kind of cutting edge and you know 10 years ago was sort of on the fringe and to see it really come into the mainstream has been very exciting and you know you don't get to to do that in with everything um i do think though that um it's important to keep in mind that for folks who care about these issues animals or the planet, other other concerns, other causes. You don't have to necessarily always be personally involved. So you shouldn't necessarily think, oh, I have to um, do this one job and that's the only way I can kind of impact. Because, you know, that there is way more opportunity. So say you want to do some other job for a while, you want to be an actor or you want to, you know, be a famous musician or something. Maybe you use that platform to help these causes or you donate some money to them or you do something like that. So uh, I think there's a lots of ways to don't think to, you know, kind of get into one job to, to do, to kind of see the change that you happen. But, you know, if you want to, uh, definitely I encourage that too. Uh, find something like I did and just, you know, latch onto it and hang on and, you know, for years and eventually, you know, um, you, you will, there will a position will open up for you and, and, and hopefully it's, it's the right fit. But for me, I, yeah, I, I couldn't uh, really see myself doing anything else. <laughs> and that's a good point, Kevin, because so many of us started as volunteers. That's right. Yeah. And um, I think it's such a great way to, um, you know, try out the work to make sure that it's okay, works for you too because, um, you know, not everything will be a fit, um, but it's, it's such an important thing to, to get involved and, and find ways to volunteer, not just for helping those causes, but for helping your own, you know, career. Um, it's, just, it's a, I highly recommend that. Definitely. All right, are you ready for the last question? I am. <laughs> I'm sad it's the last one. Hi, my name is Savannah, and my name is Vanilla. 
We were trying to decide what our favorite animal was, but we can't decide because there's so many animals in the world and we love all the animals, so we can't decide. We said all of them. So we said all. My question is what can we do as children to um, help get animals out of captivity? My question was, um, what do, um, what do you do, um, to help the animals, help the animals in America, in the United States? Bye. Bye. Oh, that was a cute one to end on. Uh, so, uh, the first question there was, um, what can children, what can you as children do to help animals get out of captivity? Uh, a big thing is being ambassadors for this idea. Uh, whether you're in school, I know nowadays it's tough, you're not in school, but anytime you're interacting with your peers or with your teachers, you know, you can really uh, impress them by talking about these issues in a way that shows how much you're paying attention. Um, you're talking about really cutting edge science. These are things that adults are reading in the news every day. Uh, they see young people like Greta Thunberg that are making a lot of noise about the climate. And so there is a lot of value in um, communicating this to adults, to people who are older than you. Uh, believe it or not, they are really genuinely impacted by that. So you might think, oh, you know, the adults are kind of running around and making all the decisions and you might also think they're really screwing things up and uh, that's a fair assessment. But at the same time, you know, I think they do respond when young people come out and are very passionate about animals um, and the environment and other things. And, you know, frankly, it, it makes them embarrassed. I think a little ashamed that they have, um, cause I think they can remember when they themselves were children and having, you know, really strong feelings for animals and for, for other things and and then kind of losing that as they got older, you know, having their career and their job and all these different stressful things in their life kind of take over. And I think they've, a lot of people, adults have really felt like they've drifted away. So to have a child come and, you know, communicate a message like this in a way that's very uh, kind of detailed and to the point, I think is powerful and I think is going to help us uh, convince more of those adults to vote in favor of, of these efforts, for example, or um, if any of your parents are judges, <laughs> yeah, I would especially encourage you to uh, stress the importance of this for them. Uh, that's just a joke, unless, you know, you can get my email address from Mickey. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, and then, you know, as far as what we do to help animals, well, a big part of what we do is to, um, to get folks like you to care about it. And, uh, you know, we, we have, you know, a relatively small number of lawsuits. We're talking about a small number of animals. And sometimes it can feel like, oh, my God, you know, these problems are so much bigger. There's billions of billions of animals out there that are suffering in one way or another, usually directly because of human activity, because of us. And so it can feel a little overwhelming, to say the least. But... Um, by, again, being ambassadors, by doing the cases that we do, we create ambassadors. So in that way, even though we're, you know, just a small group, you know, 12 of us or so, uh, we're able to do the cases we do and push them out into the world and have people learn about them and then really kind of take it on and begin to multiply it themselves in different ways, uh, you know, with our help or sometimes doing it um, kind of on their own. So. Um, that's, I think, what we try to do is put out the best information and the best arguments that we possibly can. Um, you know, we're, we're studied by some of the uh, kind of leading legal scholars and these, you know, really well-known international publications and, and different newspapers and things. And so we really try to uh, put out the best product that we possibly can. Um, but we do that because we think that that's how the mission will reach the greatest number of people. And so um, that's, that's what we try to do. And so, um, so with that, I think, I think, um, 
I think we'll close. It's been about an hour, so I want to thank all of you um, for for tuning in. Um, I hope that uh, if you're not on our email list, or if you're having any trouble getting on that, just get in touch with us. You can send Mickey an email, or you can send me an email. Um, it's just k schneider at nonhumanrights.org, and we can get you on there, and uh, we'll keep you up to date on everything that's happening. Uh, we have an exciting um, new T-shirt today. Um, I don't know if Mickey's able to show a photograph of it, but we, you can find that. Um, we'll be posting about that on social media and stuff. And uh, it's a kind of an Earth Day design that we're pretty excited about. And all of the proceeds of that go to support our work. So you can, you know, kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, we think a conversation starter if you're wearing it out there. So it helps to spread the message about our work. And we think it's also a pretty cool looking t-shirt too. So um, uh, we will, we'll be posting about that. And um, yeah, like I said, if you have any other questions at any time, we're happy to, uh, to take them. You can email us at info at nonhumanrights.org, uh, info at nonhumanrights.org. And uh, we're happy to, you know, like I said, get back to you or put you in touch with the right person. And um, we have another seminar coming up on uh, next Wednesday, the 29th. And folks have uh, really responded well to these. I think people appreciate um, you know, having something a little different to, to listen in on and, and watch while, while, they're, um, while we're all locked down. So we've, we've had a lot of fun uh, putting these together for folks. And um, yeah, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us, myself and Mickey, for tuning in and, and for supporting us. And, and we really couldn't do what we do without you. And, um, you know, on Earth Day, on, and just like every day, our hope is that uh, through our work and uh, by inspiring others, that we can see science and, and justice and, and these principles and how connected we all are on, on the planet. Um, we, we hope that we can see those values really begin to become front and center in, in our world. And we think that, um, you know, the time is clearly, is clearly upon us. So, um, you know, everybody stay safe and stay in touch and please, uh, you know, don't hesitate to, to ever get in touch and thank you all again. Thank you everyone. And have a good Earth Day. Yes, happy Earth Day. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Kevin. Bye.